Well, welcome to another episode of Breakaway from the Rat Race. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with J.R. Gondek. Uh, J.R. is a partner and managing director with the Learner Group. Uh, Learner Group is a financial advisory for, uh, firm that provides a collaborative approach to wealth management, uh, incorporating investment management, financial planning, and estate planning and estate coordination. And um, so he has over 22 decades of, uh, of experience, uh, specializes in uh, multi-generational estate planning to maximize wealth return from families. As I said, JR, this is a mouthful. There's a lot of big words out there. So, but thank, uh, welcome to the show. Appreciate it for having me. So, um, so tell me a little bit about uh, what kind of clients are actually you're helping currently? Uh, what, you know, the services that you offer around estate planning and stuff like that. All of that sounds like a lot of uh, wealthy people that go to you. Yeah, we, we've evolved over the last two decades. When, when we started, it was mostly just investments, building portfolio stock. Whereas today we work with entire families. And it really goes from the matriarch and patriarch to the kids and grandkids and look holistically. And you can think of everything a family's interested in needs. We look to provide from a financial planning to estate planning to income planning, you name it, reviewing insurance, because it really looks at the wealth return. A lot of people like to focus only how much did I make and the investment return, but you're really missing the big picture and including everything and the titling of your assets and all of that for the entire family. So that sounds like a lot of these people are, so this is great that they're thinking of it as a family. I mean, this is one of my goals as well. And, you know, when I wrote my book too, like it was about, yeah, you, you, uh, you can retire early, you achieve financial freedom, but that's not enough. You have to think about your kids uh, and because, you know, it's going to be even harder for them uh, to get started. Why are you the next generation? Why do they always have to start from ground zero? I think it's uh, it's important that the family supports them so that you kind of like the whole family kind of rises up generation after generation. 100%. And you can never start too early. I have four young kids, you know, between four and 12. And just, you don't have to go into too much detail, but getting to think about and making it comfortable to talk about topics through planning and finances, high level and such is just really good because it, too many times, you sort of don't want to steal the fire in the belly from the next generation and you're sort of left on to your own as the next generation starts to build and you don't transfer that knowledge or, or things away. And it's just, it, it, we try to overcome that because it's just, it, it's just not a healthy relationship for the overall family we've found. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, this is definitely a challenge passing on the torch. Like I know that a lot of people, you know, the uh, let's see, the, the parents are interested in uh, in restaurants or hotels and all of that, and their kids are not interested in that field. Um, so the transition, you know, is is going to be a little bit difficult. So how would you, how would you handle a transition like that uh, in these situations? Well, we, we're a big fan of keeping it simple, right? Nobody's an expert. We're all different backgrounds. Interest levels are, are different. You know, some people like to really go into the weeds of understanding investments. You know, others like to stay high level. And as a family, if you're really going to connect with all generations and as you're thinking about your kids, your kids are all different as well. Mm -hmm. So we really like to be high level, get it down to a basic level, whether it's estate planning, financial planning, or investments, so that you get to, to simple topics that everybody can feel comfortable understanding and then being able to communicate. And you, you take hotels as an example, right? I mean, you might not understand all the nitty gritty details, but you can understand how cash flow works and how much something mm -hmm. makes and what values are worth, right? Mm -hmm. And you just work, work with the topics that are pretty simple and it really helps to make it more comfortable so that you don't get the effect of the eyes glazing over as you try to get too into the weeds and you just lose you know, the, the, the generation or different people in your family. Yeah, especially if you have a 12 year old child that uh, <laughs> you don't expect them to understand the whole hotel business or restaurant business, but at least they know that, oh yeah, this thing is making cash flow, is putting money in the bank and it has certain values and, and then they can get a little bit deeper later on, I guess. And, and with my kids, I, like I said, I started very young, four or five years, just basic concepts. Hey, you, you see those packages are delivered from Amazon, right? Or you're on 
watching your YouTube channel and, you know, here's kind of how it works. Here's the major company that owns that. And you can see if they're a good company delivering, if you save your money and, and put it into good companies, it works out to, to save you extra money over time and real basic concepts to just get thinking a little bit broader about not just the product or what they're consuming, but a little bit the nitty gritty, how it works high level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing too that you mentioned is be comfortable talking about, about money, about estate planning, about legacy and stuff. Uh, this is very important. Typically uh, for most people talking about money is difficult in the first place. Uh, so how do you make it comfortable to talk about money with your kids? Well, again, keep, keep it simple. And every family is different. So we, like, we have two or three different versions of how we like to operate. Some is just the, the overall structure with no numbers. You don't want to share how much wealth is in the family. Totally fine. You just start talking about here's the entity, here's how it works, here's how things flow. And then as you evolve as a family, you start to fill in maybe some of the values and how it works. And then, you know, depending where you are, you get very much in the, the detail of how everything and, and how much is, is where. And really, it, it, it helps overcome the, the scare of, of talking about that if you just talk structure with no numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know my, my kids were very interested with that. I mean, uh, we started doing some businesses about around 2000, uh, in year 2000, 2001. And uh, one of them is a low carb grocery store and all of that. And uh, yeah, my kids were, my older kids were very interested and he wanted to know how everything was working. Yeah, we were buying this product from this distributor at this price and we're selling it at this price. And then, so it was, um, it was great to kind of show him kind of like how these numbers are working and how you're making money uh by doing that then and, and why are people buying from you why aren't they just buying from the distributor well it's because they don't want to buy a, a pallet <laughs> they just want to buy a box so that you know that kind of stuff so that was very educational i think from that uh from that perspective and, and a great starting point for a lot of this whether it's a business or a family is that what we work with is a simple net worth statement so many people don't have that one page you list everything out, retirement accounts, private assets, how they're titled, and then you get a bottom line, liabilities, insurance, you name it. And it's such a good starting point to organize, especially when you're working with an advisor. It's so helpful. You know where you are and track that you know, twice a year or a couple of times a year of just updating that because so many times you might have invested in something years ago and you forgot about it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you find that over time and it really just helps keep things organized and then keep you on track from a financial and, and ultimately estate planning perspective. So from the, uh, so a lot of the, the, the people that you're talking to, they have, you know, the high net worth, net worth individual. So some of these strategies like being comfortable about talking money, I can see that this is something that could really relate to, you know, everybody, you know, to, uh, to be able to talk about that, even though they don't have a massive portfolio, maybe they own a house, maybe they, uh, you know, they have some income somewhere or stock or 401k and kind of like being able to talk about that. Are there any other strategies that could be, uh, could be leveraged or could be used by people that, you know, kind of like middle-class uh, families that they can leverage? Well, one of the most common ways to, to start a conversation is over your kids or grandkids because it, a, everybody cares a lot about their children or grandchildren, but families don't like to communicate. So the, the, the topic would be like, how are you saving for your college retirement or college savings, right? If there's not, sometimes the parents are already setting things aside in a trust or other vehicles, and then the children are setting up college save plans or 529 plans, and that might not, might be duplication. So mm -hmm. a lot of times it's a good way to start a conversation is, hey, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, I'm starting to save for my children's college retirement. Can we talk about a, a family plan overall? Because what we find so many times is both generations are doing it and it's not consistent, yeah. right? Whereas if you, if you communicate to family, it really helps to overcome, you know, not getting to how much is in the whole pot, but it's a, a common theme or a common topic that's easy to, to get that conversation going. And then you can see how families can relate to that as you explain to grandma and grandpa are doing something and you're doing something, they're not consistent long-term and it's hard to look out 20 plus years. 
but there's pros and cons to that not being properly communicated. And that's an easy strategy to, to talk about is, is saving for college. Yeah, that's that's true. The other thing too is around uh, the, what a topic that I like too is about kind of like the, the family bank kind of situation. I mean, you can start with something relatively uh, small and then start building uh, as you go and then have that concept. How many of your high net worth individual are using something like that, like a family bank to, uh, to help their children and grandchildren? Well, the concept works very well where you, you, we like to work backward is to, if you think about I'm 20 or 30 years from retirement, how much might I want a year in income or cash flow, mm -hmm. right? And that helps to, to build how much I need to save today and how much I need to put away and invest to get to that cash flow or family bank, because it really builds into the needs of, you know, if one of your goals is to pay for your grandchildren's college tuition. Well, you need to have a saving and a cash flow in kind of that family bank type of concept. And it all fits mm -hmm. together, whether it's your personal financial plan or overall. And, and that cash flow concept, you know, of looking out and working backward is, is very consistent, especially in times of volatility like we see today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of cash flow. I think of uh, of uh, yeah, cash flow as as the main kind of thing, not the only thing, but this is, should be kind of like your main focus, and then drive your uh, your other strategies around that. So, uh, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about kind of how do we plan for the future. I see a lot of uh, talk, like especially Wall Street, they keep talking about oh, you need to save money, save money, save money in your 401k and blah blah blah, and but not many people are talking about, okay, well, how's that money going to be converted later on into a passive stream of income? And, you know, am I oversaving? Should I be doing something else? Should I be diversify? How should I set up everything? But I think, as you mentioned, I think it's really starting to think backward and look at the future and then how much passive income you're going to need and then define your, your strategy. So can you walk us through kind of like that, that process that you're using? Well, it's the, it's the biggest thing we learned after the financial crisis in 2008 and 9, because prior to the financial crisis, you know, a lot of your retirement planning would do all the Monte Carlo simulations and the market on average is going to make 10% a year, no matter what mm -hmm. simulation you make. And the trouble with that is over time, that's correct. But the reality is we're human beings and behavioral aspects of investments get to us. And it's the sequence of returns that really get people. So in 2008 mm -hmm. and 9, when the market fell in half, if you had just retired in 2007, yes, if you're able to ride that out, it would have worked pretty well. But what we learned from that is changing that dynamic because the cash flow, if you in 2007 needed 150,000 to pick your, or 120,000 to make the numbers easy, you needed 10,000 a month to retire on. If your portfolio was generating 10,000 a month, yes, you still would have had a value drop in 08, 09, but the cash flow would have been relatively steady and it really helps your mindset go through the ups and downs of the of the market to kind of have your portfolio working for you in retirement. So as you build up and get to that number, what we found is you start to transition as you get closer to retirement to slowly build that passive income stream, whether it's real estate income, dividends on stocks, interest on bonds, you name it. And that's very sustainable in the ups and downs of the market and really helps to protect and it helps to overcome getting emotional when you're watching the stock market go down or other aspects because that income stream tends to be very, very steady over time. Yeah, yeah I've noticed that quite a bit too about people that are afraid of, uh, of investing in rental properties because they think, well, what if the, I'm just going to wait, trying to time the market, first of all. They say, well, I'm going to wait for the market to crash. I say, okay, well, maybe, but that's because they're looking at a short-term horizon and saying like, you know, if you look at 20 years from now, this house is going to be worth more than it is today. So yeah, you could have saved a couple of thousand dollars waiting for a down uh a market crash or a market correction in the real estate but in the end it's not going to matter it's just focus on the cash flow and even mm -hmm. if the you get under under um on your on your mortgage the worst case scenario uh is uh yeah you, as long as it cash flows and you pay your mortgage you know you're fine you know again 20 years down the road you're not going to worry about that yeah and what, what we find is it's a mindset change you spend your mm -hmm. whole career working you're getting that paycheck every two weeks or, or whenever it's it's coming in. 
then as you transition to retirement, there's no paycheck. Mm -hmm. You have to trust your savings and your income streams to be that paycheck. Yeah. And it's a yeah. different mindset to trust that. But again, if you have that cash flow coming in, it really helps to, to navigate you know, the, the ups and downs and the inflation and all the things we're seeing currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, this is a good point. So how, how do you calculate now your, uh, your passive income, kind of what I call a passive income target at retirement? So how, do you, how would you calculate that? You just, what we do is you go through kind of the financial plan and it doesn't matter where you are in life, where you are in, in wealth, because in, if you're early part of your career saving, it's what's the number I need to get to. And you try to think through all the goals you can possibly think of weddings, you know, a retirement home, you name it, build all of those into your kind of wants and needs. And it, over time you, you map that out. Now, when you get into retirement, you kind of update that financial plan. In many cases, if you're in a high net worth or ultra high net worth situation, it's really what's the maximum amount of money I will ever need. Because with that, once you solve for what that number is, you can start talking about wealth transfer or gifting or charitable intent if you want to do that. And it, it works. So and a lot of that is just based on what's what's the cash flow I will ever need, whether I need to build to it or once I'm in retirement. And then it, it really navigates other family planning conversations or estate planning or or and, you know, as a family, what's the most I'll ever need? Yeah. And I think this is this is great because it's it's folk you're in control at that point right so you have uh the um uh, you know kind of like what kind of lifestyle you want to have and you determine how much you want to have in, in passive income which is important a lot of the assumptions out there like the the retirement calculator they assume right off the bat that you're going to be oh you're going to need only 80 percent of your of your final income to do this and it's like no, that's not that's not necessarily correct. I mean, I, I may want to, I think there's going to be some things are going to be cheaper, other things are going to be more expensive, I want to travel more, I want to do this more. And, you know, yeah, I don't need to buy expensive clothes, I don't need to commute and all of that. But it's re and I don't want to reduce my lifestyle. I, you know, I want to and this is the time where I work very hard, I want to enjoy my lifestyle after that. And um, so that, that's why I think you, people need to look a little bit about the, these assumptions. Well, and, and you're, you're exactly right. I mean, everybody assumes you'll spend less. The reality is you have more time. And on average, people in retirement spend 20 to 30% more than they did while they were working mm. because you have more time to travel. So that we automatically build that into assumptions that you're going to spend more because that's the reality of where things are. And then the other thing it does for is is there's this mentality of always want to maximize how much money you have, right? But the, the more you can be comfortable with the income stream, the more you can start to transfer and help out your kids or grandkids sooner. Because the reality is if you wait till you leave this earth, a lot of times your kids and grandkids don't need it by that point. It's nice to get to the, the money after you leave this earth, but it's much better to be proactive and start to do that transfer while you're living. A, you can watch them appreciate it now. And then two, you can educate them so that if you can start with smaller amounts of money, by the time the larger amounts are, they're more prepared for it, that it's more likely to last and they're, they're better stewards of the overall family wealth as well, doing uh, wealth transfers while you're living. Yep, no, that, that's, this is great. And yeah, it's, this whole thing is uh, on one side is the accumulation mentality, trying to get as much money as they can, as people can, instead of focusing on, on the cash flow. How much cash flow do I need to live on? And uh, it's just it's just completely different mentality, uh, and I really like what you're saying about uh, helping helping your kids and grandkids. Not when you're dead. Uh, I guess you don't really use that term, but don't wait till you're dead to <laughs> leave this earth uh, to uh, to do that. It's much more uh, gratifying, I would think, and uh, much more helpful when uh when the kids are younger and your grandkids are there and then to kind of and that's why i thought like that family bank would be great you have like a, a grandkid that want to buy a car and they say well you know grandpa or grandma are going to lend you the money and you have to pay pay it back and blah 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 and kind of get into that mindset and educate them on how to how to manage their money well the thing we've, we've done a lot of over the last number of years are family meetings and they're, they're really helpful to get the communication as a family going, because a, a lot of times 
families just aren't comfortable. They want a third party, either an advisor or somewhere else to help facilitate those conversations. And the other thing we find with those is sometimes the kids don't want mom and dad or grandma and grandpa to know how much they have because maybe they might not share equally or other. And if we or if an advisor is kind of sitting in the, the middle of the family helping to navigate those conversations, we understand where the wealth is between generations and the optimal way to structure that and really help get the conversation going, you know, whether it's, it's sharing a lot of information or, you know, as families evolve, it really turns into legacy planning. What does the money mean? Where do we want it to go? What are the values we have as a family? How do we transfer those? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's a very good point. And also kind of like, also the strat, like not the strategy, but kind of like the goal of the family. I mean, some families, they say, well, you know, this is, you know, the, the kids may have some different ideas about where they think a business should go or the, the family, the family investment should go to uh, for the future, you know, thinking about the future. And uh, <clears throat> so that might be interesting to see that. Well, one of the big topics that we run into with families is the concept of fair versus equal. Okay, yeah. right? And you think about it, like, what does that mean? Right. And so many families are modern families, right, where it's maybe a second marriage and there's different kids from each spouse and, you know, they might not be equal. Do you share as of each side of the family? Do you share equally among your kids? Do you give less to your more successful children, right? These are all wow. tough conversations that you need to navigate. And the more open you are talking these through as a family, especially when it's, you know, the matriarch and patriarch level of giving your thinking, you're less likely to cause family conflict in, in the future. Yeah. because they can understand and then as as parents you can listen to the feedback from your children and maybe make some updates based mm -hmm. on on where things are and it's very helpful but that fair versus equal yeah is a, is a challenging concept especially <laughs> in the modern family yeah exactly i mean uh, i don't know if you know that bit but uh, my my company martel turnkey or one of one of my company martel turnkey we're all uh it's a family business so i have my my wife and i are involved in that as well as my two sons and so 100% involved in this business. So uh, it's kind of, um, it's interesting to see the dynamics and what other different kids and different people in the family contribute differently. And um, yeah, so that, that fair versus, um, you know, value is, uh, is very important. That's for sure. And you're fortunate you have both your children. And if you had a third child who wasn't in business, <laughs> that's where it really gets to be a challenge. Oh, like, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and my wife and I have been married for over 30 years. So it's the same. We don't, didn't have a divorce or anything like that. So I was like, I can't imagine what some of the, some of the other families are dealing with. And um, yeah, so that's, this is very important. Yeah, very important discussion, definitely. Uh, luckily, I, was, uh, I started talking to my kids very early on about money and finance and all of that. So that was, but it was kind of, yeah, it was an interesting discussion how, where money is, how money is made and where it goes and, why we don't have money at the end of the month <laughs> so uh let's uh, so let's go back to the, so now we have a passive income target we look at kind of like how much we need to to live and stuff and then how do you back back from that and say i need you know twenty thousand dollars a month uh, in order to do everything i want to do at retirement and then so how do you back that out and say you know this is this is the kind of investment that i want to do and kind of like back it out to today, how do you position yourself today um, to kind of minimize risk and stuff? Well, we like to do liquidity analysis, right? And can you get access to your money today? Or how soon can you get access to the money? So you, that's a factor in weighing the, the income stream. Then there's ups and downs. Sometimes, you know, interest rates are higher or lower and you need to rebalance between those liquidity buckets, whereas real estate, could have some good cash flow, but you can't get your money out this afternoon, mm -hmm. right? There's constraints on that. And you want to weigh the pros and cons. And then you just want to be cognizant over time as the ups and downs, as rents change or interest rates or dividends change, how to, to kind of keep those, those balanced targets overall so that you continue to have that consistent stream overall. But liquidity is definitely a big, big consideration. Yeah, exactly. If you, especially if you have like some big emergency, uh, you want to be able to pull the money out and, and like medical emergency or other, even non-medical emergencies, you need some, some significant amount of money 
then yeah so i think being able to have at least part of your assets or investment very liquid is, is good if you have everything in real estate it could be a little bit difficult uh and this this is also one of the reason uh, one of the things that we're starting as well is a, a tokenized real estate fund so we're planning to launch that by the time you see this uh, show it's going to be launched already and that's under martel invest and people are going to be able to buy tokens uh digital tokens in real estate that are representing a share of a portfolio of uh of real estate rentals so we're focusing on cash flow but the the, the point here is that it is it is fairly liquid so if you need to have to uh, it's not like a syndication where your money is locked in for five years you can actually sell your token uh, back to us or in the open market and then you're able to get your money out so kind of like a best of both world you're you're in real estate you're getting cash flow but then you have the liquidity aspect of it um, so that that's what we're working on trying to solve some of these problems with real estate so. it's definitely important consideration that'll improve because we, we're big believers in inflation protection. Real estate is one of the good long-term places to invest for inflation protection. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, the other thing too is, um, so if you invest in stock market, you mentioned the stock market before, mainly uh, you talk about dividend stock. Uh, what do you think about that, uh, that 4% rule, the 4% kind of uh, asset withdrawal rule, um, where you basically are, you know, look taking, or. Uh, selling 4% of your asset value uh, every year uh, in order to, to generate that cash flow uh, into and be living on it. We're a big believer that we, we like to work with four to 6%. Mm -hmm. So for people that want to kind of live a little more, I wouldn't say dangerously, but a little bit more, you kind of get to the, the 6% withdrawal over time. You know, you have to live through a little more volatility because if you're spending that, you have to take on a little more risk to sustain that. Whereas if you stay to more the 4% range, tends to be very steady over time. And, and that's where, you, you know, if you're on the lower end of that, that usually opens up other opportunities to do other transfers or, you know, have more growth for the future as well if you're spending on the lower end of, of the range, you know, overall. But we're a big believer of that 4 to 6% range. That really helps you work backward to retirement. If I need that 120,000 at 4%, I need 3 million, right? And it's really helpful to kind of set those goals from a portfolio standpoint too. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very good. So what, uh, in terms of like the 401k and all of that, uh, are you a big proponent of the 401k? Because I'm thinking a lot about people that want to retire early. They don't want to wait until it's 62 and a half and having to deal with penalties. So they're not too keen on the 401k. What, where do you think the 401ks are? Heading. Well, if you look overall, especially if your company's matching, you know, it's a it's a no brainer to max those out. And a lot of times there's a Roth 401k feature of your, your 401k. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is you pay the taxes today and then you can withdraw out of that retirement tax free in the future. Yeah. And the nice thing with the Roth is there's a five year holding period. And then you can typically pull the money out tax-free and don't have to wait necessarily as long. So it gives you some flexibility. So there you're maxing out the match that a company is going to give you, take advantage of that free money, but keeping some of the flexibility. So you don't have to wait till 59 and a half to start doing some of those withdrawals as well. And it's a good oh, balance. 59 and a half. <laughs> Otherwise 62 and a half. Uh, thank you for the correction. Uh, the, um, the other thing too is the uh, yeah, and also in the Roth, the Roth IRA, you also have the uh, you know all the gains that you're making in the Roth IRA are tax free. So that's that's the other thing. So especially if you're young, you get to go and uh, you know and make the gains tax free, and then you can withdraw also tax free because you paid your you invested with your after after tax basically. Which when you look at, at times like we've been in the last few months where the markets are pretty volatile and down, you can consider Roth conversions. If you already have some money in your IRA, you consider paying those taxes at these low asset price values, convert it, and then have that future recovery tax-free in the future. So there's, there's good planning tactics when asset prices are cheap like they have been recently. So the Roth conversion is basically you uh, you cash out part of your 401k or your non-Roth uh, IRA, and then you pay the taxes as if it was a distribution, a, a cash out from that that fund, and then you move into uh, into the Roth IRA. Is that right? 
Correct. So for example, if you're in a 20% tax bracket and stock prices are down 20%, you know, you in some sense paying, saving the tax on moving it because asset prices are down. Now you have to pay tax in that amount, yeah. but it's the 20% rate and the asset prices are down. So there's a lot of good planning reasons to consider some of that. But again, you have to have the, the cash savings outside of the 401k to come up with the, the tax funds as well. So you have to properly yeah. save for next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. Um, so uh, any kind of uh, other strategies that, uh, that you can think of that uh, like most like middle America could, uh, could implement? The hardest part we find is just being disciplined, right? Have that plan. You defend that monthly savings or quarterly savings or annual saving target. Make sure you set that aside and are diligent. Right. When, when things are good, keep doing. When things are bad, keep doing. And just really avoid looking at that for many, many years and not let the emotions get the best of you that things are down. Maybe I won't invest. I'm going to keep the money in, in savings or cash or not make that or hope for a better entry point on real estate or stocks. You stay disciplined and follow through on that long term plan and it pays off over time. But that's one of the hardest things we find is build up that plan and defend and be disciplined on following through. And that's where it's nice to have an accountability coach or an <laughs> advisor to, to really hold you accountable to that. Did you save your 25,000 this year? Yes mm -hmm. or no, right? And it's good to have that because it, it's just invaluable as you get that compounding over time to get you close to retirement and allow you to retire sooner if that's your goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And so, so you, yeah, you recommend basically a, kind of a accountability coach someone that's going to be on your um on your over your shoulder making sure that you are uh saving and you're investing the way you're supposed to and following on the strategy uh for the people that don't have that like what, what are some of the ish, issues that you see like is it because things happened or or they just feel comfortable that oh yeah i don't have to worry about that i'm good well it's so easy to sort of keep up with the the neighbor or the Joneses, so to speak, that so-and-so got a new car and took this trip and I, we're going to do that, right? You got to build that in and be disciplined that instead of saving, I took the trip. Well, that, mm -hmm. that means you're going to have to work longer to retirement, not get there sooner. And if, mm -hmm. That's okay if you're, you don't mind working forever, but if your goal is really to retire early, you can build that trip in your budget. You just got to cut from different aspects of your life. You don't go to the expensive dinner. You go to you know, something where you cook from home and, and you really got to be diligent about where you find that money and prioritize your cash flow. But you really have to defend that savings pool and, and not enjoy it too much now because then you just takes longer to enjoy it in retirement. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you kind of edge your bets saying, what, what is the probability? There's a lower probability that I will enjoy that retirement than today. So you have to factor that in as well. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. And it's a balance between the two because nobody yeah. wants to just work and not enjoy it, especially yeah. since the pandemic. So many people want to retire sooner or enjoy their money sooner as well, because it's the old saying, you can't take the money with you when you leave this earth, yeah. right? And nobody knows when that day comes. Yeah. So uh, in the, we're in a interesting times uh, these days. We have inflation at 8.3%. We have like uh, increasing interest rate. The Federal, Federal Reserve is trying to uh, you know, curb the inflation and not go into recession, all that kind of stuff. Uh, unemployment is great, um, you know, and things are, you know, we have a lot of kind of an asset, I would say asset inflation in this, uh, well, we used to in the stock market. Uh, we're definitely seeing still asset uh, asset inflation in um, in the real estate. Um, so, where do you see uh, kind of what what does your balance portfolio look like today? If you have a new client, um, you know, and where would you recommend that the uh, the invest and what kind of like what does the portfolio look like? The al asset allocation, basically. So, depending where you are in your stage of life, if you're early on still building. Not to say it's a good thing, but it kind of is a nice thing to see things down because as you continue to save your dollar cost averaging into long term assets cheaper, mm -hmm. right? And it's very helpful to continue to do that. And just not don't look, continue to save if you're early on a career. Don't be focused on, oh my gosh, I lost X percent or X dollars. I need to be more conservative. Think about the positive. I'm continuing to invest at these lower price levels 
and I'm looking out, that's going to get me there sooner by putting more aside now. And some of this, you can accelerate some of your savings today. Take advantage of asset prices being down and, and, and such. If you're close to retirement or in retirement, we like to focus on the cash flow. Don't focus on the value being down. Let's make sure and double check your plan. Make sure the portfolio and your passive income is more than what you need and focus on that as opposed to focusing on how much asset prices have shrunk in the short run. Because if you, whether you're early in your career or in retirement, you could let your emotions get the best of you if you focus too much on that, watching the TV and letting kind of the, the media influence some of your behaviors. And those are the two aspects that, that we focus on whether you're in retirement or you're saving. And it, it just helps to, to take the emotions out of where things are, given how emotional things are with inflation and all the other aspects and volatility we're seeing. And those are two good takeaways that you can think about as, as you're planning or in retirement. Yeah, very good. So uh, JR, uh, any, uh, if people want to reach out to you, they want to learn more, where can they reach out to you? We put a lot of content on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn or our website, you know, Learner Group or, or myself on um, LinkedIn, you know, we do mm -hmm. monthly kind of podcasts or recaps, our thoughts on the markets or planning topics or other things and a, a lot of blogs that are out there. So LinkedIn or our website are, are two good areas to, to reach out. Oh, so this is great. So your, your podcast and your webinar are, are much more in line with kind of like what's happening today. They're much more accurate in terms of, because this show, for example, uh, I mean, if you're watching now, it was probably recorded like uh, six or eight weeks ago. Um, so, but your webinars and your podcasts are kind of like daily more uh, accurate in terms of the actuality of, uh, of the market. So that's good. Yeah, the markets tend to be more timely and then we'll talk about planning concepts that are more timeless. So we try to have some content that's out there current and, you know, long-term as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, JR. It was a pleasure having you on. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Talk to you later. Thank you for listening to Break Away from the Rat Race with your host, Eric Martell. If you want to share your story and experience with our listeners, please message us on Facebook at Break Away from the Rat Race. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast on iTunes.